My theme for this morning is a poignant, poignant place. A poignant place. I wonder this morning, have you ever discovered or found a place that has completely transformed your life? Um, For us as Christians, we can say, yes, that has happened. But it's very interesting how many of us look or even live for holidays. While at work, which can be quite stressful, we get excited about going away, don't we? Uh, We see half term is on the horizon, Easter, summer holidays, Christmas, and we look forward to rest and thank God for that. Thank God for the moments he gives us. We can enjoy our families and the blessings of creation. I remember years ago, I had a dear missionary friend of mine who was taking a break in Keswick in the Lake District. And there was a house there for missionaries to retire to. Um, You had to book in advance, but when you got there, it was a lovely place to rest for a while and spend some time away from the pressures of, of missionary life. Well, uh, if you've ever been to the Lake District, it is a spectacular place. Now, I hope this works. Let's see. There's a picture of the Lake District. It is the most wonderful place to visit. In fact, it's very different to Scotland, which has a more kind of rugged beauty about it, but it's very beautiful. Well, uh, Steve was speaking, my friend, to one of the locals there, and they said to Steve, have you been to heaven? <laughs> well, obviously not yet, but um, he said, well, what do you mean heaven? I said, well, there's a place here called, he- the locals call heaven. It's not heaven, but it's heavenly, and it's just breathtaking. You've got to go. And Steve said, well, I've got to see this. So he said, where is it? He said, well, you've got to follow this map, and, but you've got to get up super early, really early to find this place. It was just One of those places you can't just turn up late to, you had to get there at a certain time and follow this map so carefully. Well, um, Steve uh, armed himself with a camera, took his wife and woke up at the alarm clock and headed for this place. It was a glorious place. I'm not too sure if this was the place, but it was absolutely stunning. In fact, he took a picture that he brought back home with him, and he won a competition because his picture was so incredibly dazzling. So beautiful was this spot. Such places on earth do exist. They make holiday brochures, don't they? They they light us up. There's a place here in Psalm 34 that's even brighter. David found himself this morning in a very, very special place. Greater than Keswick. Greater than any earthly resort you'd want to fly to. In fact, far greater than any place on planet Earth. It's almost as if David had found the finest of gold, the most precious stone possible. And it left him searching for a scribe. And he penned these wonderful truths. It's important we get some backdrop to this passage, and I'll go there in a moment. But David was used in this way this morning for our benefit and blessing. David's life was full of victories, full of tragedies, and yet God spared him to write this precious psalm. Well, as I said this morning, um, today is Mother's Day. And it's not always one of joy, but sadness, which has led me to to consider for this this morning the pen of David, because great were his debts. And I hope God would bring us comfort and encouragement and challenge as we look at this psalm for this morning. I've got four heads I want to look at with you. The first one is uh, the resolution of David. Secondly, the reliance of David. Thirdly, the reverence of David and the rescue of David. Four heads which I hope will help us reflect upon David's life. 
Let's turn to the shall, the, shall we, to the first point then, the, the resolution of David, verses 1 to 3. The resolution of King David. Now again, we must look at the context of this passage, otherwise it becomes a pretext. Look at what's happening here. Let's go back in history. If you can turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 21. This is the background to this passage. <clears throat> One Samuel, chapter twenty-one. I'm going to jump back a few chapters, but, but arrive back to where I've just pointed you to in a minute. But this is a very unique place that David is in. David, at this point in history, has been anointed the king of Israel. But guess who's wearing the crown? King Saul. King Saul is wearing the crown, and. At this point in history, Saul is wanting to kill him. This is not a light occasion. This is terrifying. When the king wants you dead and he owns the place, where do you go? What do you do? And if you read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, it's frightening. David literally dodges a javelin. Saul literally launches at him, and it, it, it hits the wall. David is in a pretty serious position, and the horrors of the previous chapters to chapter 21 are just horrible. David has returned, and the story is, is sad. It's, it's one of those tear-jerking history, history moments where you just have to look, sit back and say, Lord... This is humanity for us, isn't it? This is the human heart. Saul, this king who was looked upon with such favor, and yet David, who returns from defeating the Philistines, uh, the women, it says in the, in the previous chapters, came from all the cities, and when he came back from battle, they danced. You can read about this in chapter 18. They danced before the king, king Saul, and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And the Bible tells us that Saul was very angry, very angry, and eyed him from that day forward. Saul believed that this King David would become king. And the Bible tells us that David acted very wisely, very wisely. He was a very wise man, David. We know he messed up, but he was and did act very wisely on most occasions. All Israel and Judah loved King David. In fact, Saul was afraid of him because God was with him. He was so highly esteemed. I'll just turn back to chapter 18 for a moment and read a few verses from there. You could turn that back there if you like with me. Uh, chapter 18, verse 28. Just read a few verses here. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually. Saul's desire for David's death led David here to literally run for his life. And there's a moment in the field with Jonathan that David's weeping. He's weeping. It's tragic history. And he's got no food. He's running for his life. And then we read about him going to Ahimelech, the priest. He takes some bread off him. He takes Goliath's sword, which he slew, and he finds himself before Kish, the king of Gath. And that's, we turn back to chapter 21, verse 10. David, we read in verse 10, arose and fled that day before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And what do we read here? This is a frightening place to be if you consider the background of where he is. 
the servants of Akish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in the dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? Verse 12. Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched at the doors, on the door, excuse me, of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of mad men? That you brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Frightening stuff. Here he is running as a fugitive. And the background to this psalm is a place of desperation. I don't know this morning if you've been hunted, but David was a hunted man, like a deer running through the thickets. What words can express the turmoil of heart this young man faced? And he was a young man. Now it must be pointed out at this point that his doing, his change of behavior was not that essentially which rescued him it was God's mercy mercy for the action he played in this account here Uh, it was a desperate place and despite this failure in his life at this point he finds God's mercy so incredibly lifting and so if we can turn back now to that psalm that's the that's the background to psalm 34 And it helps us better understand how David could pen these precious words. And notice, as we look at this first part of the the message, that the great resolution of King David was to bless the Lord at all times. His praise, he says, shall continually be in my mouth. We have here a great move of the heart. Despite his circumstances, despite all the things going on, he decided his tongue was going to bring forth praise. He will praise God continually. Matthew Henry says this, All opportunities for it, as to praise, and renew his praises upon every fresh occurrence that furnished him with the matter. Verse 2, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Verse 3, David's heart is beating strong and he calls us this morning to join him. Magnify the Lord with me and exalt his name together. But David, you're on the run. David, look at your life. It's a mess. It's a complete mess. You're running. You've got no food. You've got Goliath's sword in your belt. What's going on? How can you do this? Because David knew God. It changes everything. If we know God, it changes everything. And despite the mess up here, he can stand and say these things. That is a light so bright and I want to join him in that. I want to stand beside him. This is a call for us this morning. To stand before God in our gath. And remember who he is. And to praise him. If our redeemed life before the throne where the angels will be eternal praise, why should today be any different? The trouble is, the troubles, the difficulties, can so easily rob our minds and take us off course 
Think of Peter when he was in that boat and the waves were crashing in. He lost sight of the Saviour. Well, there's some keys coming up that I want to look at this morning that we don't lose sight of God. But the resolution of David here is to ever love and praise and magnify the Lord. That is a place greater than any Keswick you can bring me this morning. That is a place we need to be in. To extol these unchanging realities that God is God and he's good. Despite the debt charge of our uh, circumstances which can be so so dark and, 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 and painful. So David is resolute. He's also reliant on verses 4 to 8. He's also reliant in verses 4 to 8. It's very noteworthy um, that part of David's experience here is finding God's mercy and grace in troubling times. Look at verses 4 to 8. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Look at verse 6. The poor man cries out to God. The poor man. And the Lord hears him and saves him out of all his troubles. I love verse 7. This is incredible when you consider who this is. The angel of the Lord encamps, surrounds in effect all those who fear him and delivers them. And like honeycomb stuck on a spear, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Now again, let's go back to Gath for a minute because there's a context here to this passage. Life can be so detached from the Bible. We, we, we lose sight of where people are and where they've been. But this was a very dark place for young King David. He's being hunted down by the king himself. He's a desperate man. And yet his reliance this morning, his reliance is what is so transformative now, uh, look what he speaks, what he says in verse 6 here. The poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. David's voice is so powerful, his, his experience so transformative. The poor man cries out. They're glad and they hear of, of David saying, The poor man. The poor man can't do much. He's got no confidence in himself. His friends can't help him. But God does help him. And this is the point David brings to us in these particular verses. The poor man also had reliance. He was unable to even help himself. No one helped him. But God helped him. God helped him. When we turn to God, friends, it changes everything. When our reliance is upon God, it changes everything. And the key that God would have us see in this passage, again, go home today and read through Psalm 34. The key is prayer. The key is prayer. In what was his darkest hour, David sought the Lord. And we read, God heard him and delivered him from all his fears. This is not a natural law like gravity. It will just happen. The media will say that to you. They'll say, well, just, it will ha life will, be, will, will go well for you in the end. All works out. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But if you're in God, it does. The Cumbrian-like heaven was not found by just wandering into a, into a deserted place. It was found through following guided steps, setting the clock and watching the map. And so it is here. God does deliver. God does save. God does transform. When we pray, if you're not praying, what are you saying? I, I can do it myself. I can, I can wake up in the morning and do this day. Can you? James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And sometimes 
our prayer lives could be so shallow. We lose sight of who he is, but God brings us to Gath, a place of trouble that we end up crying out to him. But is that something that you and I do? Do we cry? Actually cry out to God? Do we plead in our prayers? The poor man cries out, and the Lord hears him, and saved him, verse 6, out of not just a few troubles, well, he, he helped him, no, out of everything, out of all his troubles. There's a hymn we sing in church called O Great God by Sovereign Grace Music. It says this, Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. To live in that dependency upon God means we need to change our prayer life. Gath is a summons, friends, for us this morning to pray. And if God is going to come through for you, if God's going to break through into your life in a wondrous way, then you need to rely upon him and rely upon him in prayer. This is the key, friends. This is the roadmap to, to the, the Keswick experience. This is the way forward. David said in Psalm 44, I will not trust in my bow. Now, David was a warrior. He was a man that, I mean, these gladiator films that you may have watched and things, had nothing on David. He was an incredible man of, of steel, in fact. God, God used him to destroy the enemies of God. But he says this in Psalm 44, I will not trust in my bow, neither shall I my sword save me. He fought lions <laughs> and things like that. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise thy name forever. This is what God, God does to those who cry out to him. James says this, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah, I love this. James, I love you. James, he says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Just in case you thought he was some superhuman. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Imagine that. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. <laughs> Amazing. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Prayer should be fervent. It should be intense. It should be passionate. It should be persistent. Paul says in Colossians, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So, if we're to find Keswick's heaven, if we're to find this poignant place that God brought David to, there needs to be a new reliance in our lives that seeks God fervently that cries out to him in troubles. I don't know this morning what your troubles are. It could be a trouble in the workplace, in school. It could be a trouble in your marriage. It could be a trouble in your family. It could be your health. You might be this morning in Gath, and God wants you to come to him. Cry out to him. He wants to bring you to David's place. He does. That you might extol these wondrous words here in this psalm. Stand with David and praise him for his great transformative work in our lives. His ears, the Bible says, are open to their cry. When they cry, he's there to direct them, protect them. His ears are open. And this, friends, should be a constant comfort to us. Might God help us? Thirdly, in reverence. I think reverence is a bit of a light word to use here because there's a, uh, this is speaking here in this psalm about the fear of God. The fear of God. Something that we can so lose sight of as well. 
David speaks of a special angel that surrounds all those that fear him. Um, I think society downplays angels. They're often these fat little babies flying at shoulder height. That's, I don't think, an angel. Uh, it powerfully conflicts with the scriptures in that, in that sense. These are very, very powerful beings. Cast your mind back to 2 Kings chapter 6, and that's where the king of Syria is going to send horses, chariots, and a great army to surround this city. Imagine you're in that place. There's a, there you are, and uh, there's Elisha with you, and you wake up one morning, put the coffee on, and you go to the window, and there's a, there's a massive, ar- there's a huge army surrounding you. Just pounding, dr- they're going to capture you, they're going to kill you. And what does Elisha say? Don't be afraid. Have you seen out the window, Elisha? There's thousands of them. We're finished. Elisha prays, O Lord, open his eyes. He may see. And the servant looks. His eyes are open. And he sees the mountain was full of chariots and horses of fire. For those who are thus are more than those who are with them. The angels of God that praise him continually are ministering spirits for us. And I could tell you stories of missionaries that have said, there was angels around us where eyes have been spared, lives have been secured, miraculous things happen when people pray. The angel of the Lord, it says here, encamps around those who fear him. We'll look at that in a minute. It's a very special place here, isn't it, that David's come to? He's aware of this place. It's glorious. Better than Keswick. This is amazing. This is a place where God is with me, helping me, delivering me. And the angel here, the Lord, encamps. There's an angel in 2 Kings 19, I I believe it's the angel of the Lord, slew 185,000 men. One angel. Woke up all these corpses. This angel we speak about here keeps them, protects them. And maybe in life, you're going through life like David, you're just so hemmed in, you feel so crushed and so vulnerable. When you go to bed, put a pounding heart. What about tomorrow? The Bible tells us God is with us. The angel of God, the Lord himself, encamps around us. David goes on in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. He speaks to the lions that lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Then in verse 11 he says, come. And he's speaking to children now. I love this. To children. Listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? I'm sure all of us would raise our hands to that one. And loves many days that he may see good. And here is David's prescription. Ready? Verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. David is, and I get an excitement here from his pen, He's met the sunrise. He's seen the glory of this place. And he wants the children to listen now to him. Listen, I will teach you, he says, this fear that is so transformative. Of all the duties of his office, whether it be the war or the harp, it's the fear of God that David wants us to lay hold of this morning. Especially children. Charles Spurgeon says this about the fear of God. He says this, 
pay to him humble, childlike reverence. Walk in his laws, have respect to his will, tremble to offend him, hasten to serve him, fear not the wrath of men, neither be tempted to sin through the virulence of their threats, fear God and fear nothing else. The great blessing, friends, of God's people follows this godly reverence, this godly fear. And David bolts on this wonderful point. If you desire life and you want to see many good days, then listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen. The hungry lions, they're always searching for food. The young ones, the next prey item. But those who fear God and seek him, they won't lack. And here's the roadmap. You ready? Keep your tongue. Keep your tongue. Do you get that in those verses? Keep your tongue. Very marked point by the king. Uh, One that we do well to mark in our minds as we come to this passage. It's so easy to lose our lips. But David would have us here to think about the tongue especially. If we're going to understand what it means to seek the Lord and walk in the fear of God, then keeping our tongue has to be very much in our minds. This is a practical business. James says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And friends, if we want to control our tongue, which we need to, then we need wisdom. We need help. It's a small member, says James, but it causes so much trouble and you need wisdom. The wisdom, he says in verse 17 of James, that's from above, is verse pure. It's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So keeping your tongue this morning from evil and a particular evil here of lying, David says, keep yourself from that. Distance yourself from deceit. Keep your tongue. And secondly, depart from evil and do good. This is very much a rerouting of the heart sat nav this morning. Verse 14, depart from evil. Leave it behind. Don't go with those who do it. Stay away from them and instead don't just depart from evil. Do what is good. Do what is good. For our souls, ourselves, but also for others. Do what is good. And then David draws us to consider the path of peace as opposed to strife and contention and those things that bring confusion, says James, and every evil work. Seek Peace, says David, although in the midst of war himself. David, you're you're in war, yes. He's following God's instructions, but he still says this, be a man of peaceful disposition. Don't break the peace. If the dove of peace flies away from your rooftop, recover her. Don't lose peace. This is the royal map, friends, that David's got for us to think about this morning. And David may have penned these words about the fear of God in reflection of his own guile. The fact he pretended to become a madman. The saliva down his beard, he's scratching the door. David, what are you doing? And maybe he's pointing out here, don't don't do that. Reminds me of Christian and Hopeful in Pilgrim's Progress when they they, they were in Doubting Castle and they escaped And they got that great big mound of stones to warn pilgrims. Do not do that, what we've done. Avoid it. So painful. So treacherous. You're in great danger if you follow that path. The sobering word in verse 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. To cut them off their remembrance from the earth. How sad is that? But that's, what, that's, that's God's position. That's his response to those who do evil. To cut the, even the, the memory of them off from the face of the earth. 
He turns his face against them because they fought against him. Ruin is set before them. That's why Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. Because wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate that leads to life. Reminds me of, again, lots of pictures this morning, isn't there? But there's a picture, some pictures here of a, a place in the south of England. You want to come, guys? Um, it's called Box Hill. And uh, when I was a, a missionary there, I used to venture to this place. It was just beautiful. And uh, it would allow me to walk the hills and pray. I just had some very fond memories of precious prayer walks there. But the terrain was quite hard in places. It was hard. Tough. Chalk downland. Not squidgy, soft, springy moss. It's, it's, it's tough, but the views are spectacular. Here's some more. A lovely path that runs up uh, into the hills there. Does your legs good, I tell you. But there's a picture here of a, of a path that runs through this happy valley. This reminds me of the Christian life. The Christian life is narrow. The Christian life is tough. But it's glorious because God's there. And God is with you. Narrow is the gate, says Jesus. Difficult, difficult is the way that leads to life. You're going against the grain. You're going against those who would want to drag you to one side. God says, no, the path to life is narrow. It's amazing sights there from Box Hill. So these are wondrous deliverances that God has for David. And he holds out to us again in our gaths this path to life that is resolute, is reliant, and is reverent. And last of all, as we close our time this morning, uh, the great rescue, the great rescue. Please, dear friends, hold on to these wonderful verses. Because David's not finished at verse 15 or 16. He wants to focus again and be reminded of this. This word deliverance keeps coming up again and again and again. Verse 17, he delivers them out of all their troubles. He saves such as have a contrite heart. And look at verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. This deliverance is real. It's not some pipe dream. He delivers his people, the righteous, out of all their troubles. I don't know many of you this morning, but if you're in trouble and you're a Christian, know that God will deliver you. Gath is so ghastly, yet David knows the way out. The Lord, in verse 18, is near to those who have what? A broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Please look at this. There's a nature here, a nature that is very precious in God's sight. It is a character that God responds to. This is what God's like. He responds to those. He, he moves. He, he comes to us when we are broken in heart, humbled in spirit over our sin, having no confidence in ourselves, in our own merits. But our confidence is in Christ. And we come with that broken heart. God comes near to us. The Lord is near, the Bible says, to those who have a broken heart. And he saves those who have a contrite spirit. Isn't this a picture of salvation? I didn't come to Christ when I was 18 saying, well, I'm not so bad, really. I realized at 18 years of age, if I died that night, I wasn't going to heaven. No way. No way. But I realized that Jesus died for me. He, he was bruised, the Bible says, for our iniquities. He who knew no sin became sin for us. 
I didn't come with a badge or with shoulder lapels. I came on my knees and said, Lord, thank you that you died for me. Please receive me and save me. Words to that effect. There's a nature here that is very precious in God's sight. And yet, yes, we may fall as Christians into many gaffes and troubles, some very severe, but the Bible wants to remind us this morning, these, these, these troubles we face, these gaffes we enter, will not be to our ruin. They won't be. So please, this morning, take comfort, Christian. They will not be to your ruin. As a righteous man, as, as young as David was, David had many afflictions. In fact, I've been reading through Samuel and two Samuel in my quiet times, and it is a sobering story. The war, the blood, the metal, the fear, the defeats, the victories. It's a, it's a, it's a life of incredible... Uh, this, the, the things that David got up to. We're so divorced in that life, but the, it was a life that God used. A life that God had on paper for us to consider and reflect upon. He had many, 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 many afflictions, deep ones, painful ones, yet God delivered him from them. In the Chronicles of Narnia, um, Susan, you may remember the story, uh, uh, this ivory horn was given to Susan of Pevensey. Or was it Susan Pevensey? I forget her name. This animal horn. And she could blow that horn in times of emergency. And if she blew it, help would always come to her. And I saw that, I thought, wow, that's so true. C.S. Lewis was a Christian. He wrote uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. It's a picture of what we have as God's people. Help will come. Help will come. Deliverance will come. But are you those this morning who are resolute? Will you praise his name? Will you rely upon him? Will you revere him? And will you know his rescue in your life as you trust in him? Or may these realities help us find a place this morning beside King David himself. May God help us and all for his glory. Amen.